All plants have a preferred temperature range, light, and water requirements. When those are perfectly met, the plant has a greater chance of thriving. When they're not, the plant could exhibit stunted growth, fail to fruit or flower, or just simply die. In this video, we're going to cover these critical considerations, so let's jump in. Location. Figuring out your zone. A plant hardiness zone is a geographic area defined mainly by a 10-year average minimum temperature. Some zone calculations also consider other factors. The most commonly used hardiness scale in America is the United States Department of Agricultural Scale. It ranges on a scale from 0 to 13. I'll link to that one in the description section below so you can determine your zone. In the description section below, I'll also link to the equivalent European and other parts of the world's hardiness scale. As the USDA system is based entirely on area's average annual extreme minimum temperature, it is limited in describing the full climatic conditions a gardener may have to account for in a particular place. These maps do not include maximum temperature, humidity, light, and soil moisture content, all critical factors in a plant survival. They're also irrelevant if you plan to grow entirely indoors or in a greenhouse. They do provide a starting point for the types of plants that will thrive in your outdoor environment and a general idea of when to plant. Planting schedules like the one that I'll also put in the comments below, they give a grower a general idea of when to plant. In some zones, successive planting, it's possible. In other zones, a growing season is very narrow, so more attention must be paid to when the last frost was likely passed and when the first frost will occur. Seasoned gardeners understand their zone and often start their plants indoors when snow is still on the ground. That's why they're harvesting well before everyone else. Plants react differently based on the temperature, water, and light they receive. Tomatoes, for instance, will only set fruit if the temperature at night for at least three days is above 55 degrees. After pollination, if temperatures are above 100 degrees for three hours or more in two successive days, the fruit will not set, and likely the flowers will fall off the plant. If you deprive a plant of water, it may go into self-preservation mode, bolt, and race the seed. Understanding the Goldilocks zones for each of your plants will also help you to adjust your watering schedule, how vulnerable they may be in extreme weather conditions, or even if shading, fanning, or supplemental light will be beneficial to them. All of this stems from knowing the zone in which you're planting. Most all the plant labels will carry an indicator of their preferred zonal range. These are broad. A carrot, for instance, can be grown in zones 3 through 10. Pineapples can be grown in zones 11 through 12. Now, that doesn't mean that you can plant pineapples in Finland or carrots in the tropics. You can, so long as they're inside a structure where temperature, moisture, and light can all be artificially adjusted. These zones are guides for temperature ranges and climates that help gardeners determine what plants will thrive in their environment and what plants will need special considerations. If your vegetable plant prefers a high zone number, it won't like frost and may require full sun in your area. If your vegetable plant prefers a lower number, it will not like high heat and may prefer partial sun or shade. Download our small space high yield gardening guide by clicking on the link in the description and comments section below. Enjoy the video. Care. High versus low maintenance plants. I haven't seen a lot of discussion on this topic because most people assume if you're gardening, you're also planning on spending a good deal of time doing that. I don't have hours and hours to devote to gardening, and I wish I did, but other things in life require my attention. For this reason, I have changed my grow areas to be as low maintenance as possible over the years. Some plants will only do well if you keep the weeds out. Other plants will be encouraged to set and produce good fruit by carefully pruning them and controlling green growth. Over the years, I've dabbled with this quite a bit with my tomato plants. Tomato plants are a perfect example of this. There are two types, determinate and indeterminate. Determinate tomato plants are smaller and grow like a bush. They usually grow up to five feet tall, so they're perfect for a small garden or container gardening. Indeterminate tomato plants often have a more vine-like structure and can grow up to eight to 10 feet tall. Obviously, indeterminate tomato plants must be trellis, staked, supported, and pruned. Determinate tomato plants may only need to be supported with occasional pruning. All tomato plants, they need to be pruned. And when I plant mine, I always plant the first set of leaves furthest at the base. These will turn into roots. Then after the plant has grown a bit, I have to prune the leaves at the bottom of the plant above the soil line. As the plant grows, I have to control growth and focus the energy to the fruit by pruning what are called suckers, offshoots that will only create foliage. Some gardeners nearly strip their plants of leaves when fruit sets, but I'm afraid of harming the plant, so I leave a considerable amount of green. This also means that I'm more susceptible to tomato hornworms and other voracious plant eaters. I've had to learn how to deal with these pests by spraying an organic bacteria. All of that requires a considerable amount of attention and time. 
Because of this, I have gone from a high of eight varieties to just two plants per season over the years. We're talking about years of learning and not just a season. Another consideration about care and space is dwarf varieties. These tend to be more compact and smaller plants that can still have excellent yields. Because they're smaller, they require less maintenance and are a popular choice for apartments, containers, and small gardens. At least at this point in my life, I need lower maintenance plants. For instance, I have some pepper plants, garlic, sunchokes, amaranth, huckleberries, chard, lettuce, onion varieties, carrots, and a few other plants that I can simply check on every other day or so. Then I can pull the occasional weed, fertilize, water, or whatever else I need to do. They're low maintenance plants because I simply don't have the time. When you lay out your grow area, keep the time you have to tend it in mind. If you desire to set it and forget it, make sure you choose super hardy, independent, and compact plants. Melons, squash, beans, peas, and other sprawling plants will require trellising or guidance in your outdoor space, and they only sometimes climb on their own. If you plan on looking after them nearly daily, that's fine. If you plan on ignoring them, you might find that they're not setting fruit properly, rotting where they came into contact with wet soil, or have a bug infestation eating them. I've also learned over the years that consistent watering schedules are critical to well-developed fruits and vegetables. If your lifestyle requires you to only water when you get around to it every third day, and then soak the plants well, your plants will die, the fruit will crack, and the vegetables will exhibit the stress by being poorly formed. Some plants like water on their leaves, other plants do not. For some plants, it can increase the likelihood of leaf light. There are sometimes high and low maintenance plants of the same type. I can grow a Walla Walla sweet, but it has 14 to 16 hours of daylight and requires 90 to 110 days to mature fully. That narrows the growing season for some. They also need very particular and consistent moisture levels. Every year I do an onion patch, but I have planted Egyptian walking onions this year. The smaller onion variety that sets bulbs at the top of the plant requires almost no maintenance on my part and can be planted much closer together. With each plant you choose to grow, consider your time and lifestyle. Don't rely upon the few lines on the label on the pot. Read up on your particular variety, understand the maintenance it will require and how well you can maintain the perfect growing environment for the plant. You can still succeed with high maintenance plants that you ignore but your results will increase when you give the plant the attention it needs. Hybrids versus Heirlooms Most vegetable seeds you purchase at your local store are a narrow range of cultivars that have been carefully selected to provide growers with the best harvest from the hardiest of plants. Sometimes they have been cross-pollinated or hybridized to provide the most robust plant possible. That's great for many, but it ignores the thousands of other varieties. Many look at the seed section of their local store and marvel at the possibilities. I see this as a very narrow range of options. Most seed sections try to emulate the local produce section of your grocery store, where perfectly manicured displays of uniform sized fruits and vegetables form neat displays. On the other hand, heirloom varieties offer the grower varieties of plants that aren't typically associated with large-scale monocultural agriculture operations. I use the term heirloom varieties quite loosely to include all those fruits and vegetables our ancestors grew or forage that you don't likely find in your grocery store. The colonial farm looked far different from today's massive monocultural agricultural operations. That's an application of the term that is far broader than it was intended. These heirlooms often have much better flavors and character than the perfect cousins in the store. The trade-off, however, is that heirlooms may be more susceptible to disease or infestation, and they may take more effort to cultivate. That's why commercial growers tend to refrain from growing them. The other reason is the limited palate range which many in our modern culture have grown accustomed to. We expect strawberries in the United States to look and taste a certain way, but there are an estimated 600 different varieties of strawberries stemming from five or six original wild species. The globe or garden strawberry you may get at the store will taste and look very different from Alpine, Fragaria Virginia, Aroma, Camino Real, Sweet Charlie, Pinberry, or wild strawberries. I like to eat avocados. It's one of over 500 varieties, but your store probably only has Oss or Forte varieties. You may be impressed with your store's seven different apple varieties, but you would be missing out on the other 7,500 varieties. Your local grocery store has maybe eight different varieties of tomatoes, like Roma's, Globes, or Beefsteak, to cherry and plum varieties. Yep, there are more than 10,000 tomato varieties available. I don't think a person can say they don't like tomatoes until they have at least tried a thousand different varieties. In your local grocer's defense, it would be hard for them to sell some of the lesser-known varieties of apples over the beautifully polished hybrids. It would be harder to sell a green-striped zebra, black cherry, or white cherry tomato over your run-of-the-mill aroma tomato. The same is true with almost every vegetable or fruit we consume. Consider all the varieties with each plant you think about for your garden. 
You might also take a trip to your largest local farmer's market. There you'll often find a more varied selection and odd varieties. With some seed saving, you can grow these same heirloom varieties. From the farmer's market, you are assured that the particular variety you're growing is successful in your local climate. Someone has already tried to grow them in your area and was successful, or you wouldn't be buying them locally. The farmer's market also allows you to taste and work with the vegetable or fruit before you try to grow a bunch of it. You may like the taste of butternut squash, but you will find the taste of baby blue Albert even better. It's sweet, flavorful, and perfect for roasting, baking, pies, or canning. Tasting what you're going to grow and cooking with it will help you decide as well. I grow several different hot peppers in my garden. Too many to be honest. Nobody else in my family eats them and I'm trying to figure out what to do with the jars of dried peppers for the season alone. I usually make at least one massive batch of hot sauce per year, but even then, they're hard to get rid of when many of the friends and family can't handle the heat. Don't grow something so wacky and foreign to you that you or your family will have difficulty getting anyone to eat it. I wouldn't have gotten anyone in the family to eat any of the amaranth I grow and had not stuck it in their baguettes. Nobody in my family would have knowingly eaten purslane, broadleaf plantain, carrot tops, or dandelion leaves that I foraged from a yard and garden had I not snuck it into their salads. In nearly every meal, I get a suspiciously raised eyebrow with the accompanying question of what's in it. Generally, most of what you grow will taste far superior to anything that you can buy at the grocery store. The vegetables you find there are often grown thousands of miles away, picked before they ripen, and are encouraged to ripen by spraying them with ethylene gas. There are 110 different chemicals in the official Florida guidebook for commercial tomato growers that a farmer can spray on a field over the course of a few months. Many of these chemicals on their own, the EPA rates as acutely toxic. That means that they can kill you on their own. Look, I'm not trying to scare anyone here, but there is no comparison between the taste of a homegrown, vine-ripened tomato and your standard grocery store globe tomato. A final note on heirlooms versus hybrids. Heirlooms are often open pollinated, meaning that their seeds can be saved from one year to the next and will produce plants with the same characteristics as a parent plant. If you try to grow a seed collected from a hybrid, you may not have any luck at all. Many hybrids are specifically engineered not to produce successive generations. Think of hybrids as often the mule of plants. A mule is a cross between a male donkey and a female horse, but is typically sterile and cannot reproduce. One unique thing about open pollinated plants is that they can cross pollinate with other plants of the same or similar species. This can happen naturally through the actions of wind, insects, or other animals that transfer pollen from one plant to another. So what you set out to grow can be influenced and changed depending on how close it resides to other similar varieties. It's important to note that if you want to save seeds from open pollinated plants and maintain their genetic purity, you must take steps to prevent cross pollination. This can be done by isolating the plants from other varieties of the same species or hand pollinating the flowers to ensure that the pollen comes only from the desired plant. Garden Purpose Keep one question in mind as you launch into this venture or redesign your current garden. What's your purpose? If your objective is to be a self-sufficient food grower and produce all the calories that you need to live, you probably don't have the space for that. Suppose you do have the space. Great. But do you also have the time? I would love to grow squash and I have before, but many plants take up more space than I'm willing to sacrifice in my backyard. Still, some zucchini plants can be relatively compact, so I have options. If your purpose is to supplement your food supply, you might be able to accomplish that by just adding a few plants. This is a great goal, especially for beginner gardeners. A ginger or turmeric plant doesn't look like your traditional garden vegetable, and you're not going to be able to sit down and eat a bowl full of it either. Still, the roots and leaves are edible. There are not many calories there, but there's a lot of iron, potassium, and magnesium. Lemongrass, sage, basil, oregano, and other herbs don't offer many calories, but they do add flavors. Growing them in a small space teaches you how to grow. You'll learn how to cook and dry herbs, trying to use them all up and save them for the winter months. I'm also not going to grow tons of beans for survival when I can still buy them at the low prices in the stores. I'm not going to flood my backyard to try and grow rice. Eventually, I hope to be self-sufficient and grow my own food, but I know that's not today. Dwarf and bush varieties may not seem as fun to grow as a giant mortgage lifter beefsteak tomato, but you may not have the space for that enormous intermittent variety. Most plants you buy commercially will indicate their average size and maturity. If that's a four foot diameter bush, do you have the space for it? A more compact bush cherry tomato like Tiny Tim could provide you with loads of tomatoes throughout the grow season, and it would allow you to focus on one plant to understand better how to grow plants in your area. This garden series focuses on small space gardens like you would find on your balcony apartment. Still, the whole series is valuable to anyone who gardens so long as they can ask and answer the questions of their garden's purpose. 
You might take a run at it and decide you would rather expand, contract, trellis upwards, switch to microgreens and sprouts indoors, or even mushrooms. I want to tell you to be open to changing what you grow and how you grow each year. Not all gardens are rigidly planned out and always the same. Because of soil depletion in some types of plants, you can only sometimes plant the same things in the same soil year to year. You may find one thing you grew left you with too much and another barely a bowl full. Align your garden purpose with your goal and allow your plans to change. You can start small and figure out the best ways to grow more. You can start big and resize and realign your garden as you understand the plants, the space required, and their time commitment. You will be well positioned to expand and fine tune your operations at the end of a few seasons. You might start a garden on someone else's property or a community garden. You might work up a trading agreement with your surplus. You will grow as a gardener far more than your plants if you will set out with a purpose in mind and adapt as your skills and knowledge grow. Whatever you decide to grow, understand the zone that you're in and what that means to the plants that you're considering. That's the basis on which all of your decisions should really be made. Consider the conditions and space the plant will take. You may want to grow one type of plant, but you realize that you just don't have the space for it. Understand how frequently you're going to need to tend to the plants. Most importantly, understand the wide varieties available to you in your garden's overall purpose. When you look at the other videos in this series, you're going to see a host of considerations, things such as climate, space, soil, personal preferences, difficulty levels, seasonality, and even companion planning. In this video, we have added location zone, care, type, and purpose. All of these videos together, I hope will help you narrow down the garden that's right for you and is gonna be realistic for your situation. I'll post a link to the playlist up in the cards above in the description section below to this series on all these uh, videos that we've been doing for gardening. You have hundreds of more options and varieties than you see in the grocery store, the seed aisle of your hardware store. Even in a small space, you have many growing methods available. Use our sun mapping video and thoughtfully apply everything that we've been showing you. Draw out a plan, sit down with it for a while and evaluate it daily and modify it as you consider plant size, zone, and purpose. These winter months are the planning months. The next phase is to order seeds, prepare your space and method, and get the plants growing. Watch for more videos coming on that. As always, stay safe out there.